Okay, I promised just a little bit on the concept of moral inversion. <clears throat> so the first thing I wanted to do is just read a couple of other places in this book where the concept is brought out by the authors. Uh, under the heading Modernity, Technical Rationality, and Administrative Evil, it's in that first chapter, um, they say, even worse, under conditions of what we call moral inversion, in which something evil has been redefined convincingly as good, ordinary people can all too easily engage in acts of administrative evil while believing that they are doing what they are doing is not only correct, but in fact, good. You know, I, uh, an initial example I can think of is the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. On the face of it, a great evil, um, indiscriminately killing thousands of people, either at the time of impact or afterwards due to radiation, with weapons of mass destruction, not discriminating between combatants and non-combatants and so forth. But it was definitely thought, um, it was sold at the time and is thought uh, then and now primarily by the American people as um, a good because it ended the war. Uh, the movie Oppenheimer now kind of like plays with this question, right, of was the development of the bomb at all uh, possibly a good <laughs> or was it just inherently an evil? So to the extent that people um, thought of it primarily as a good, that would be a case of moral inversion. Um, another case that I can think of right off the top of my head was during the Red Scare in the United States when um, figures in the government such as Joseph McCarthy we're going after everybody that they disliked by labeling them a communist and um, persecuting people, driving people out of government service, um, banning and blacklisting our authors and artists and getting in the way of our free speech rights. Um, many, many people conceived of that and it was definitely sold to them as a great good because we would be getting rid of evil. We would be purging it from our midst. Um, and therefore, all of those actions were not only necessary, but actually uh, good. All right, so just by way of a couple of, of easy examples there to kind of get you to thinking about what they mean. And then on uh, page nine, which is under the section Administrative Evil and Public Affairs in the first chapter, uh, the, here's another uh, area where they mention it under item two. They say, because administrative evil wears a mask, no one has to accept an overt invitation to commit an evil act because such overt invitations are very rarely issued. Rather, the invitation may come in the form of an expert or technical role couched in the appropriate language uh, or it may even come packaged as a good and worthy project, representing what we call a moral inversion in which a something evil or destructive has been redefined as good and worthy. Uh, the first one that they mention in this little section that's at the end of the chapter um, is uh, the Japanese internment camps during World War II. And they say that this was um, tending towards the problem of moral inversion, but it didn't quite go into that territory. Why didn't it go fully into moral inversion, right? They say that was because the, um, the administrators, such as Dylan Meyer, uh, managed, quote, managed to view the internees as citizens and kept in mind their eventual return to society. So even though... Um, the author's view is that the internment camps were the wrong decision and a bad idea and were indeed immoral. They didn't amount to full moral inversion, which is full administrative evil, because the administrators maintained an awareness of the humanity and belonging of the citizens involved. They didn't completely turn them into some abstract mass, other, inhuman, 
caricature that they could then completely turn around and say, by doing this, we are doing only good. Okay. On the other hand, they feature in this little section um, something that they've written at length about in other chapters, um, the way in which the United States space program in its infancy used former Nazis, um, in particular Werner von Braun, uh, who was instrumental in the deaths, the mass murder of Jews and other victims of the Holocaust at Middle Baldora, um, brought uh, him here among other Nazi scientists, not only gave them basically immunity, but also a nice salary and comfortable surroundings so that they could um, in institute our space program, our rocket uh, program. And actually they say here on page 131, decades after the fact, there is still no recognition of the sad background of our premier rocket development team for the space program. The Von Braun case thus illustrates the power of technical rationality to strengthen the mask of administrative evil. Masking is that another way of saying, you know, that moral inversion, that hiding of the evil behind this mask of, of good. In this case, the good of the space program and of national security outweighed even using murder, mass murdering Nazi scientists to develop our rocket program. Um, they say, we will probably never know the extent to which those who operate, who crafted Operation Paperclip knew of the slave labor and mass murder at Dora when they initiated our space program's reliance on von Braun and his compatriots. Regardless of what they knew, once the program was underway, the administrative processes and technical achievements progressively placed layer after layer of masking on the wartime activities of von Braun, Rudolph, and others, thereby obscuring the effect their values or lack of them um, and concerns about the, their past had on the organizational culture at Marshall and later at NASA. Because not everybody especially really understands that second example. I think almost everybody has heard of the, the history behind the Japanese internment camps because there is, like they said, more of a consciousness about them and it didn't quite go into full, you know, um, moral inversion at, like the Holocaust did in Germany. Um, but very few people even today uh, seem to be fully aware of the Nazi connection with our space program. Um, and the way that that was buried, I mean, it's it's actually proof of how complete the moral inversion process was that many people probably don't know about it. So if you want to know more about it, you would go to chapter four, at least in my third edition, but um, the chapter that deals with Middle Baldora and the and the uh, and Pienmund to the Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, and then also chapter five in my book, Organizational Dynamics and Administrative Evil, the Marshall Space Flight Center, NASA and the Space Shuttles, Challenger and Columbia. Columbia. It, it traces a line all the way from the, um, you know, the, the managerial uh, mindset and structure instituted by those early German scientists and how it influenced the space program all the way to the disasters of the space shuttle challengers and challenger in Columbia, where you know people were still thinking, well, we can't admit we can't admit that there might be a problem, and we'll launch the shuttle anyway, even if we know there might be a problem, or we'll ignore problems. So it's a very interesting line of reasoning um, that uh, you ought to know about if you don't already. All right, that's what that's basically what I wanted to say, just to make sure that people understood what moral inversion really means. Um, definitely, it's when people become convinced that they are doing absolutely the right thing when they're doing the morally wrong thing.